thinking this week about celebratory scenes uh, and uh, moments of celebration. Of course, you could think of many such ones. Uh, celebrations in New York after World War II ended, celebrations after your team wins a championship. There's all sorts of celebrations uh, that we could think of. The one that pops into my mind, just because the way my mind rolls, uh, is the end of Return of the Jedi, where everyone is celebrating the destruction of the second Death Star and the death of the Emperor and all of that. A scene from my childhood that, of course, George Lucas made worse uh, in the special edition by changing it. Uh, that's just one of my things. Uh, most of you have no idea what I'm talking about, so just ignore that, uh, because you have no idea that there's more than one version of Return of the Jedi, but that's okay. Or maybe your era, maybe what you think of uh, when you think of celebration uh, are, is from the Wizard of Oz when they're dancing around singing Ding Dong, the Witch is Dead. Uh, any number of occasions might come to mind, maybe the end of Hoosiers, whatever it is that inspires you when talking about celebrating and being just overjoyed. Because as we get to Romans chapter 8, we have such a statement that requires some joy from us. We're going to start with that because that's the very first verse. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The sermon title uh, has an exclamation point afterwards uh, on purpose. It's not in the text because, of course, next we have a comma and he continues to talk, but we should pause for a minute and just allow that to sink in. Because we've journeyed through Romans thus far, and as we have, we have seen clearly that all have sinned. That there is no excuse that exists for Jew or Gentile to that. And that our attempts to please God, whether with the law or without the law, have always been doomed because of the presence of sin in our lives. We've also seen, excuse me, as we've worked through Romans and read that and studied that, it was easy enough to conclude with Paul that humanity, all of humanity, stands condemned. The diagnosis is a brutal one, but also inescapable. Hope here on earth was nowhere to be found. Thanks be to God that the truth that Paul is sharing with us in the Word of God did not end there. Paul also showed us God's plan to overcome that humanity-wide deficiency through faith in Jesus Christ. Told us that it was a gift from God. Jesus is the one in whom our hope is placed. But the question that may have been bouncing around in the mind of a first-time reader of Romans someone who don't know that this verse is coming, the question might be, will it, is it enough? Given the depth of human depravity, given the wrath of God outlined by the law, which nobody has ever come close to keeping, is it enough? Is even the death and resurrection of the Son of God enough to completely resolve this crisis? this condemnation. And so here in chapter 8, verse 1, in the very first sentence, we have Paul's answer, and the answer is a resounding yes. Yes, it is enough. There was condemnation. It was deserved, and it was impending. The clock was ticking, and ticking, and ticking toward death, and on the other side of death stood hell, but not any more. Now everything has changed. Now grace is victorious and wrath is satisfied. The justice of God has not been set aside. It has been fully met. The law kept from least to greatest, beginning to end by the one who as the Son of God had the power to do that, and as the Son of Man had the right to transfer that righteousness to those who trust in him. 
And so what is the end result? No condemnation is left. It's gone, never to return. The things which you have done and those that you will still do before you die, those things that were and are a violation of the character and nature of God, they are no longer hanging over your head. This is debt forgiveness on a scale and a level of thoroughness that is beyond anything else that you can imagine. It is the great reversal of history. Death has now lost to life. Wrath has been replaced with love and despair by joy. Take note of this. The amount of condemnation that remains is zero. Zilch, nada, none. None of it remains. There are no lingering symptoms, no residual after effects, no fine print, no asterisks. As far as God is concerned, it's over. Now the implications of this are huge. We won't see the full glorious description of them until we make it to the end of this chapter. For now, rest assured that the former era in our lives is over. There's no going back from here. I don't know if you know the Stephen Curtis Chapman song, Burn the Ships, but his line there is exactly what we're talking about. It says, this is the chorus, burn the ships, we're here to stay. There's no way we could go back now that we've come this far by faith. Burn the ships, we've passed the point of no return. Our life is here, so let the ships burn. There's a whole story behind that, that's why the metaphor makes sense. Or, to quote Martin Luther King Jr., free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty I'm free at last. Looking at this text, lastly, notice this also. Not only is there no condemnation, notice who it's for, those who were in Christ Jesus. Look at how Paul describes that. We are in him. What exactly that means is a long answer. We don't have time for that whole answer. That's a big question. What does it mean to be in Jesus? But we can see the outline of it. We are not with Jesus. That would be good, but that's not enough. We are not alongside Jesus. Still not good enough. And we're definitely not beyond Jesus. Whichever preposition you want to try when I was in Fifth grade, fourth grade, we had to memorize all the prepositions and repeat them back to the teacher, uh, board about, above, after, against. I can still remember how it starts uh, all of these years later. I'm not sure the value of that, but it's there. No, no. In is the right one. We could describe our salvation and describe it light, rightly by describing us as, as it being in Jesus, but also through Jesus or from Jesus. There are a number of ways to describe that salvation. But when we're talking about we ourselves, when we're talking about where we are and where we need to be, in Jesus is perfect. It gets the point home. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Previously, sin and death had the mastery. Thanks to universal human rebellion against the character and will of God. And so it's no surprise that with death involved, this was a one-way street of self-destruction. But that's been changed. How? How? by and through Jesus Christ, whose death was sinless and whose resurrection proved the impotency of death. For those of us in Jesus, of course, sin still matters. We still fight against it, as we saw last week, as we talked about. But no longer with the law standing against us, listing our failures. 
Now we march onward with the Spirit empowering our victories over sin. The Spirit who gives life. Paul says, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. The law, as we learned, was given by God. Therefore, Paul declared it to be holy and good, but the law was not strong enough. The law was not powerful enough to overcome the handicap of having to work with flawed human hearts and minds. Tweak it all you want, it isn't going to work. The law was as likely to succeed as communism, and for really the exact same reason. Because the system was built upon dealing with real people in the real world, and they were the problem. Again, as we learned previously, this failure of the law was itself instructive to us proving to humanity that our effort and our dedication, even if it was at a heroic level, would not come close to winning against our sinful nature. It was time for humanity to start tapping out SOS. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Humanity in despair, thus comes the incarnation. Jesus, the Word of God, co-equal member of the Trinity alongside Father and Son, came to earth, entering into time and space, taking upon himself and uniting it with his divinity, the fullness of humanity in all respects except for the sinful nature. Why all this? It seems like an extraordinary effort, doesn't it? The short answer, of course, it was necessary. Had there been a way to resolve humanity's fatal flaw, apart from God himself stepping in to play the key role, don't you think that path would have been taken? <laughs> but there wasn't any such easy way. So Jesus came willingly to save us. As the combined God slash man, the life of Jesus, lived free of sin, had value and power, capable of being an offering for the sins of the world. The wages of that sin was death. Only Jesus could substitute his one death for countless others. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. In history's great reversal, the death of Jesus Christ was not the triumph of evil, nor was it Satan's great victory vanquishing the champion of God. Rather, it was their ultimate and complete undoing. To kill the Son of God, one guilty of no sin, let alone any crime, was in effect a Trojan horse. As death laid hold of Jesus, it came into contact with life itself, with the source of all righteousness, holiness, and light. Death in that moment, the moment that it seemed to reign supreme as Jesus hung upon that cross dead, was in fact stripped of its power and shown to be toothless. For Jesus could not be held by its grasp. He would indeed rise. Along with death, sin had met its match. Until Jesus' rebellion had always been the choice of humanity. Not anymore. Jesus humbly excuse me, submitted to the Father's will, proving as he had with death, that sin's power could be broken, its snares avoided, its temptations ignored. Sin had always been a false siren leading humanity to its doom upon the rocks. Jesus' perfect life revealed the bargain that sin claimed to offer to be the mirage that it always had been. He did this in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. And by living 
that life of perfection, Jesus was declared wholly righteous by the Father, faultless and pure, enabling him to transfer his abundance to each one of us. We could not keep the law. We stood condemned. Yet now we stand before God clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our old rags have been removed, our stains washed away, replaced by his spotless purity. The law stands fulfilled. We no longer live under its judgment for each and every man, woman, and child who by grace has placed their hope and trust in Jesus has now kept the law fully and forever in him. Paul ends by saying, in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The fulfillment of the law by Christ in us does not free us to continue in the immorality that Jesus paid it all to overcome. That would be the worst ingratitude imaginable. Rather, our newfound freedom opens the door to being able to live according to the Spirit. What does that mean? It means being empowered to go above and beyond systematic rules and regulations to the very heart of obedience. It is not promised blessings or threatened curses that motivate us in Christ. It is instead the love of God, a love for the God who saved us. So we strive empowered by the Spirit to bring every thought, word, and deed of our lives into conformity with our new family, the family of God. Three thoughts of application. The first one is just a repetition, but man, it's important, so we got to make sure we walk away with this. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Don't let anyone ever tell you otherwise. Secondly, the sinless life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is what made this available to all who believe. And then lastly, it frees us to live by the Spirit, embracing the daily and lifelong pursuit of righteousness. And we'll certainly continue to talk about that theme as we continue through Romans.